I've been working for uh, some time now on this Ben Eater style uh, 6502 computer. Uh, in my previous videos, uh, I showed um, how I created this debugger board that lets you single step through the code and see what you're doing on the uh, LCD screen. Uh, and that was essential for what I want to do because I'm going to be doing some more complicated things. Next thing I wanted to do is to uh, hook up, as I'd promised some people, um, the uh, 6502 Ben Eater computer to my uh, world's worst video card with vertical and horizontal scrolling. To do that, um, I wanted to make some changes to the way uh, system RAM is configured. First of all, I'm going to need a lot more RAM. And the reason is because I'm hoping to generate uh, foreground RAM and a background RAM. The background RAM will be a video that is scrollable, and the foreground RAM will be sprites, basically, or any other image you want to lay on top of that that does not scroll. And uh, in order to do that, I need to have um, the address laid out slightly differently. First of all, the system RAM, instead of being 16 kilobytes, I'm going to have to reduce that down to 8 kilobytes. And this is going to save me 8 kilobytes for video RAM, which is the same way as Ben Eater does it. But I'm going to be doing that a little differently because I'm going to be accessing 64 kilobytes total of, mem of uh, video RAM. There's going to be 32 kilobytes of foreground RAM and 32 kilobytes of background RAM. And so in order to be able to do that, I need to be able to address the top two bits in separately. So I'm going to be building a latch that um, D2, D2 and D3 are going to specify what the upper two addresses are, uh, both the uh, foreground RAM and the background RAM. And also, while this doesn't show it, uh, this shows these being wired directly. But actually in here, I'm going to have to have a uh, transceiver buffer, a tri-state buffer that will allow me to turn access from the computer to the RAM, foreground and background RAM, on and off. And the reason I'm going to need uh, that transceiver to do that is that I want this computer to be able to run during the display interval and not only during the blank interval. But to do that, I need to cut off the addresses from, these RAM, from the RAM when it's being read by the video card. So there's going to be a lot of transceivers involved in this design that I'm working on. Then I'm going to have a D0 and D1 are going to be uh, lines on the on the uh, latch that select whether you are talking to the foreground RAM or the background RAM, or um, you're going to be able to talk to both at once. Now that would be a disaster if you tried to read from both at once, but there's no reason you can't write to both at once. And so I want that to be a capability. So you're going to be able to um, set these bits, and that will allow you to... Um, right to both the foreground and background RAM at the same time. That'll have some uses on occasion. Um, one of the things uh, that you, that means though, is that the system RAM um, needs to be changed how it's addressed. Because in the current system with Ben Eater's uh, 6502 computer, the system RAM is actually selected for the entire 32 uh, bit range. Um, of the of the lower 32k, I should say, the entire 32k of addresses uh, in the system. Um, the reason you don't notice that and you don't have a problem with conflicts is that his output enable is driven by uh, basically driven by uh, pin uh, A14 by address line A14, and because of that, uh, while you can write to the system RAM in all 32K uh, addresses that it's attached to, you can only read from the lower 16K. And that is what makes it not interfere with uh, his um, IO chip or his uh, UART chip. So this is what I came up with for this. This will allow you, this, this is, uh, this is uh, already available from the Ben Eater computer, this uh, A15 being inverted and then being NANDed with the clock, which gives you basically an active low signal. And he had that running then directly to the uh, system RAM chip select. Um, but um, <clears throat> what, uh, what, what we need uh, then is to, to actually just disable this system RAM 
um, whenever it is not talking to the lowest eight uh, kilobytes of, of data. Uh, so what I did was I um, ORed that with A14. And this means that A15 and A14 both have to be low in order for what I'm calling here RS bar, which I'm calling RAM select. So this RAM select signal means that I'm in the RAM range, which is the lowest 16K of the RAM. And that RAM select then goes into another OR chip, which goes with A13, which means all three of these have to be low in order to talk to the system RAM. And as you can see from what I'm showing here, that's the lowest. That, that'll give you system RAM in the 0000 to 0001 as your upper uh, nibble of address space. So that's 0... Uh, so zero 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 it is to dollar sign zero 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 to dollar sign one uh, f f f f is going to be system RAM, and so um, th this all is more complicated yet. So I hadn't started wiring that. I just wired this up, this portion, and what I discovered was that it just did not work at all. And the reason it did not work at all uh, has to do with, as you'd expect, timing. Interestingly. It not only didn't work at my 10 megahertz uh, clock, even when I um, divided the clock signal down to 2.4 kilohertz, st it still did not work. And I suspect that um, I have found the reason for that. If you look at the timing diagram for the uh, memory chip that I'm using, um, you can see that what happens is that the data is uh, selected when either the chip enable or the write enable goes from low to high. And so at that point, um, it grabs the data and stores it in the RAM. But if we look at the uh, timing diagram of the uh, 6502, we can see that there's a very short period of time that the data is held after the clock um, goes from high to low. That's TAH here. And TAH is... Um, 10 nanos, a minimum of 10 nanoseconds. So it's it's only got about 10 nanoseconds or maybe a little longer depending on the exact chip and the temperature and so forth. But you've only got 10 nanoseconds from when the clock changes to uh, get that data latched and have the address correct. So if you look at what I'm doing here, you can see that um, when the clock goes from high to low, that's when this goes high. And um, you could see that by then, uh, well, the address will begin to start changing because the address went high after 10 nanoseconds. But it takes more than 10 nanoseconds for this signal to cascade through these two OR gates, or really around. It can take more than 10 nanoseconds for them to get to the, uh, to get around to changing the chip select. So the memory addresses may have changed on the CPU. The data may have changed by the time that the chip select actually goes low. And so that's the problem with this design. So I didn't draw it up, but I rewired this so that I got rid of, I got rid of, I, I, I went past these. And I just wired up the A15, A14, and A13 to air OR gate. So these went to this OR gate, and then this A13 went directly to this OR gate. And then I wired in the clock with another OR gate. Only instead of using the phi 2 clock, I used the phi 1 clock because the phi one clock is the inverse of the phi two clock. So that way, when the phi two clock uh, goes low and these addresses are all low, that's when the chip select would be low. And so by doing that, uh, I hope to get around this timing error. And it sort of worked. It worked sometimes and other times it didn't. Um, so that, that true not to be a, a bust. So I came up with a whole different way and I haven't drawn up uh, a uh, circuit diagram for it yet, a uh, schematic for it. But um, I can show you the beginnings of what I'm doing here. I haven't got this completed yet. But here is um, my two additional RAM chips. And this is these are a uh, bunch of um, uh, transceiver, uh, tri-state transceivers. So these have the ability to have the data go in either direction um, from the top uh, data lines to the bottom data lines or vice versa, depending on the, um, the direction uh, pin, how it's wired. So this is this, this direction pin here, which is uh, pin one, is wired low, and that's going to make the data go from 
B to A, which is from uh, the top to the bottom here. Um, but as far as address decoding, what I did was I realized that instead of um, having a bunch of complicated chips, and this is going to get worse, by the way, because I was going to fire the, I was going to feed this read select signal through another OR chip and then an AND chip into my foreground and background RAM. And you can see that this is going to be an even more delay than I had. Um, so instead of doing all that, I realized that uh, I looked in my, uh, my, my chips among my chips and I realized that I have a, uh, a, uh, metric buttload of these, uh, SN74HC138, um, address decoder chips. And the, the, the 74138 address decoder chip is, uh, takes three address lines and then it'll decode those to a low signal for uh, one of eight, for each, each, each address that you put in will decode to a low for one of eight outputs. And so it's perfect for selecting RAM where the, the chip enable is low. And I haven't wired this up to these, obviously you can see that, but I did wire it up to, um, to my system RAM to make sure that that was going to work. So how this works is I've got um, pins uh, or address lines A15, A14, and A13 all wired into this chip. Uh, so when those are all low, that's when we want the RAM to go, uh, the, the chip, select, chip enable on the RAM to go low. And that uh, is um, uh, this output here. So that makes this pin 15 on this chip will go low. And I have that connected to the chip enable uh, bar input on my RAM. And I also have that just jumper then over to the output enable um, because I could also have just grounded that. But anyway, we want the output to be enabled at any time that uh, the chip is selected. And of course, read, write is in read. If it's in write, then of course the, the data will be expecting to accept input from the microprocessor. Um, so that's really all there is to wiring this. The only thing I've got is I've got the, I've got the, uh, in order to, um, deal with the timing requirements, I have the, um, clock signal, and this is the phi2 clock signal. And I have that, um, wired into the positive gate. Let me show you the, uh, I've shown this before, but let me go to the, uh, there we go. This is the uh, data sheet for the 74HCT138, uh, 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 HC is wired, the, is wires the same. Um, and the idea of this is that you have these gates. So you need pin six, which is G1 to be a high. And you need pins five and four and five, which are G2, uh, a and G to B, these are, uh, these are active low and you need, so you need this high and these two low in order for the, uh, um, output to be in for any of these to be low. Otherwise these will all be high. So that works, uh, that works for us. All I did was I just grounded the two, the G2A and G2B pins and, uh, G1 is wired into the fee two clock. Um, and that is, gives us the perfect timing for, um, being used for, um, selecting the RAM. So we can show that this is working. I rewrote the code slightly from our, my last, uh, video so that it just, what it'll do is it'll run, run the hello world message and then it will pause, um, at a, at a, um, a controlled break as I've been calling it, basically a wait instruction. And then that, that'll wait for me to push, um, the uh, the continue button here that gives a gives it the IRQ signal to to continue. So let me turn off single step mode, and so here here I've uh, it's running that, and then if I press this, uh, it just goes to blank. That way I can you know make some changes and just retest by hitting reset, and I know that it worked because it it puts the puts the hello world message back on the LCD screen. So that's all I've got for you today, really. Uh, I wanted to show you where I'm getting started with this and the direction that I'm going um, with uh, my connection to the world's worst video card, which I guess I can start calling the world's second worst video card now because it's going to have some additional features that the world's worst video card does not have. Um, thank you very much for uh, watching 
I uh, appreciate it. If you like what I'm doing, I'd love it if you'd subscribe um, and also maybe click the like button. It helps me a lot to know that people appreciate uh, the work that I'm doing here. Thank you very much. I will talk to you all again real soon.